Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to start by saying thank you for being here, and uh, it's a great honor to uh, uh, speak to you this, this afternoon about a very important topic um, that's relevant not just for Saudi Arabia, um, but uh, the Middle East, Arab countries in general. Uh, it's uh, the challenge of employment, the challenge of youth employment in particular, um, and many countries around the world in the region have been trying many of the traditional job creation programs and government programs, private sector programs, um, uh, partnerships between the private sector and the government sector. What we want to present today is a conceptual framework for um, thinking a little bit outside the box about job creation, especially youth employment uh, programs. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, very briefly introduce you to the outline of this uh, presentation so that we know where we're, where we're going to end. Um, modern monetary theory is a conceptual framework that I want to introduce today that will uh, focus on very simple um, accounting facts, not theories. Um, these are things that are not debatable. Uh, so I'm going to start with some basic definitions of what, is, what it means to be a financially sovereign country, uh, what it means to have financial balances at the macro level for the country, and I'm going to focus on um, Saudi Arabia's accounting balances at the macro level as a nation. Um, then we're going to try to think about how this conceptual framework can help us address youth unemployment problems uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I'll, we'll go over some of the facts, some of the figures, the challenges, and some of the opportunities. Because um, it's, it's, not, it, it's not usually helpful to focus on problems and stop there. Um, where, where we see problems, we should also see opportunities. And this is something that I really want to emphasize today. And the employment program that um, uh, Dr. Matthew Forstadter and myself and other colleagues in, uh, in Kansas City and around the world have been working on uh, for, for a long time now, it's called the Job Guarantee Program. We're going to go through the mechanics of how it works, um, explain its benefits, and give uh, a large number of examples and specific examples that are relevant for Saudi Arabia uh, in particular. And then finally, I want to close with looking at the job guarantee option for Saudi Arabia with a particular emphasis on social entrepreneurship and a concept that I want to explain today, which is social venture partnership. So this is not venture capitalism. This is social venture capital, you can think of it. So with this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with the, the very basic definition of financial sovereignty, what it means to be a financially sovereign country. Three basic conditions. First, it's a country that issues its own currency. In, in, in Saudi Arabia, it's the Saudi Riyal. In the US, it's the US dollar. Only the government has the monopoly or the authority, the legal authority, to issue that currency. Second, it's a country that collects taxes in that same currency. So the United States collects taxes in US dollars, not in Canadian dollars, obviously. Same thing in Saudi Arabia. Taxes and fees and zakat are collected in Saudi rials. And then finally, the third and very important condition for financial sovereignty is never to issue bonds or borrow and promise to pay back in a foreign currency. So the United States, for example, issues government bonds that promise to pay back in US dollars and only in US dollars. So if you have these three conditions, you have full financial sovereignty. And as a result, you can think of the US, the UK, Canada, Japan, Australia, and Saudi Arabia as financially sovereign countries. Not a lot of countries enjoy this uh, privilege. Uh, you can think of uh, countries that are currency users. For example, countries who end up borrowing in foreign markets and promise to pay back in foreign currencies. Think of Egypt, think of Tunisia, think of uh, Jordan countries that constantly have to finance their deficits by borrowing in dollars or in euros or in Japanese yen. So this is, this is a very important distinction for us um, in, this, in this framework. So we're talking about financial sovereign countries, we're talking about a country like Saudi Arabia. What comes out of modern monetary theory or MMT theory is a very simple accounting identity. And uh, let me pause here and say what, it, what this means. This is not 
fancy theory. Accounting identity simply means it's an accounting truth. It's true by definition. Just like you say, one plus one equals two. Nobody will argue with you. No accountant will ever argue with this equation that I'm presenting here. What this accounting identity says, for any country anywhere in the world, all countries, it's always true that the government budget balance plus the private sector balance plus the foreign sector balance, this is foreign trade, it always adds up to zero. I can show you dozens and dozens of graphs from countries all over the world. Every year it's always true. This is not Keynesian theory or Marxian theory or classical theory. This is accounting. There's no argument about it. So let's, tag, let's take that as, as our starting point. This is the data for Saudi Arabia. This is the Saudi sectoral balances, the government sector, the private sector, and the foreign sector. I'm going to start with highlighting uh, the 2012 data. The blue line over there is the government surplus. So this is government spending minus government revenues, right? Saudi Arabia has a surplus. The green line is the private sector of Saudi Arabia. That's the private sector surplus. When we say the private sector, it's companies in Saudi Arabia plus households. So this is all the private sector. Companies and households put together, that's the second sector. By definition, going back to the equation we just looked at, private sector plus government sector balance plus foreign sector balance, they have to add up to, to zero. Now the yellow line here, this is the Saudi trade surplus, exports minus imports. So think of the world for a second as divided into two components, Saudi Arabia and the rest of the world as one group. So if Saudi Arabia has a surplus with the rest of the world, the rest of the world has a deficit against Saudi Arabia, which is the case. The yellow line is below the zero axis, and it adds up perfectly to zero. You look at this graph, this is a mirror image. If one of the bars moves a little bit, the other bar will have to move by definition anywhere in the world for any country. So the Saudi economy has a privileged situation where you have a surplus for the government, a surplus for the private sector, and a trade surplus because of the oil exports. Now, if you pause for a second and think, well, what would happen, say, if oil prices drop significantly for whatever reason? Then you're going to see that yellow line shrinking, right? The trade surplus of Saudi Arabia will shrink. By definition, the blue and the green lines on top will have to shrink. There's no way around it. It's by definition. This is accounting. Now let's think about it. It's either going to be the private sector shrinking, the green line, or the blue line, the government surplus shrinking, or both. There's no way around it. Now let's zoom in for a second on the private sector. Again, this is firms and households put together. Most of that green surplus there is firms. And with increasing levels of consumer debt, credit card debt, households are moving into significant and unsustainable deficits in some cases. Um, so we're going to have to dig into the details and be careful about the consequences of these uh, sectorial balances. So just to zoom in on the 2012 data, just to uh, illustrate, government surplus is 13% of GDP. Private sector balance is 18% of GDP. And the trade surplus, meaning the foreign sector deficit, is a negative 31. It adds up to zero. Always true for any country, any year, anywhere in the world. OK. So this is our very basic definition of MMT, or modern money theory, the, the concept of financial sovereignty. The question here is, what does this have to do with youth employment and, and job creation programs? So let me. Um, step for a second into introducing the, the labor market in Saudi Arabia, focusing on, um, on unemployment statistics. So this is the, the demographics that we have to deal with. Um, this is not just Saudi Arabia. This is very similar in GCC countries, very similar in uh, North African countries as well. Um, the youth bulge, uh, the uh, age pyramid, is not um, working in our favor. A lot of us see it as a problem. 
but I'd like to see it also as an opportunity. Many countries around the world are actually envying the abundance of labor resources, the energy that the young people are bringing, potentially could bring, to the labor market, to the productive side of the economy. Um, think of it this way. Um, many countries in the Middle East have been spending probably around 20, 25 percent of annual government spending on education and training. Not for a year, not for two, but for decades. And all that investment to produce educated, trained young people, isn't it a waste to let that go into unemployment? So you can see this as an investment that we're missing an opportunity to capitalize on, to leverage for productive uh, purposes. In Saudi Arabia in particular, there's an, an additional challenge, which is the, the composition of the labor force um, in the private sector, 90% uh, um, expat. And this has been all over the news in, in recent uh, months and, and days, obviously. Um, in terms of Saudi unemployment rate, and this is male versus female, and then the average um, uh, is the, the, the blue line. Uh, this is the last two years, quarterly data, um, calls for the least to say is urgent attention uh, and action. And this is really the, the motivation behind this, the research behind this uh, session today. This is for non-Saudis, and notice that the axes are very different. So I'm going to go back for a second here. The, the higher number up there is 40 percent, right? And for the non-Saudis, we're talking about less than, you know, 1 percent unemployment um, overall. Now, the cost of unemployment in, in Saudi Arabia, we're going to talk about economic costs and also uh, about the social costs and the, the non-economic costs. Um, there's been a, a recent study by the International Labor Organization that essentially said if, if, Saudi, Arabia can, uh, if Saudi Arabia has the potential of increasing its annual GDP, gro GDP growth by 2.3 percent, if youth employment or youth participation in the labor force matches the level of Australia. This is the benchmark country that they used for, for the study. There's a tremendous potential with that, you know, quote unquote problem that we see, the youth bulge and the youth unemployment. This is a tremendous resource for increasing economic growth, increasing production, increasing wealth um, in this country. Um, another study refers to uh, Saudi Arabia's potential for employing women. And uh, by, uh, I think the study says by 2030, if Saudi Arabia is able to match men's and women's labor force participation, there's a potential of reaching 8 9% increase in annual uh, economic growth. So we're talking about substantial resources that are not being uh, utilized uh, at this point. So yes, there's a challenge, there's a problem, but there's a tremendous potential for, uh, for growth. Um, the other thing that I want to add here to highlight that this is, we really need to act now. And this is, this is an exciting moment, not just a crisis moment for, for a lot of uh, GCC and Arab countries. Because the longer a person is unemployed, the harder it gets to, uh, to find a job. And this is not just in the Middle East, this is anywhere in the world. Tons and tons of studies showing that the faster you get young people into jobs, especially that first job, the easier it gets and the more productive they become uh, into the labor force. So this is a, this is a call for, for action. And with this, I'm going to uh, pass the mic to uh, Professor Matthew Forstatter to, um, to talk about the other uh, cost of unemployment. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, first, I want to uh, thank uh, Saeed bin Zagar for putting this session together. He's the motivating force behind uh, this session. And he's put a lot of work into it, as, as have a number of others uh, behind the scenes. And um, because of time constraints, I'm not going to be able to uh, name all of them. But uh, really appreciate uh, 
the uh, people working to make this uh, a possibility, including, of course, the Jetta Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, so, uh, Fadl gave a, a, a very nice overview of what is at the heart of modern monetary theory. And the upshot is that we can afford anything that we have the political will to, to purchase. And so if we want to create full employment, there are no financial constraints to doing so in, if we're talking about a modern money economy as described uh, by Fadl. So other costs of unemployment, um, Fadl mentioned the social costs. Uh, studies have shown unemployment is related to virtually every social problem uh, that we have. Uh, poverty, of course, crime, uh, divorce, uh, family uh, breakdown. Um, so all of these social problems have costs, whether it's the uh, resulting medical costs and uh, health care bills that result from the physical and psychological problems uh, associated with unemployment. And of course, the longer a person is unemployed, the uh, more intractable these problems become, and there are uh, a number of uh, problems that just are exacerbated by continuing unemployment. When people are unemployed, they, their, their skills deteriorate because you have to practice your skills in order to maintain them. So when people are unemployed, they actually lose a know-how and, uh, and skills. And so in order to uh, address the many social and economic costs of unemployment, um, we've been working uh, together for uh, quite some time on the idea of an employment guarantee or job guarantee. One of the things about the job guarantee, it takes workers as they are. They're, we don't say, oh, well, you've got to go train and then we'll hire you. No. Uh, th this is on the job training while you're getting paid. It's very important, okay? Uh, many training programs, unfortunately, are training individuals for non-existent jobs. And so that introduces the idea of jobs first, with pay, training later. It's on the job training, it's learning by doing, right? Uh, all of these ideas are supported very strongly by uh, the research. And these are not traditional public sector jobs. We're not uh, taking the current government workforce and replacing them with a lower wage uh, workforce. No. Okay. So uh, these are uh, going to be jobs that are in the areas of community service, civic engagement, and so on the one side, we have people who are working, earning incomes, and spending their money in the economy, and on the other side, they're also performing valuable 
public and social and community services. So it's a, it's a, a multifaceted uh, in terms of the benefits. And then, of course, these are not private sector jobs. This is not a kind of program where uh, government provides a subsidy uh, to private firms for hiring or something like that. No. Uh, these are community service jobs that pay a fixed living wage. We can talk a little bit more about what we mean uh, by a fixed uh, wage in the, it doesn't mean fixed permanently forever for all time now into the future, but it, it, it is an important aspect of the program because there is a strong price stabilization aspect of the job guarantee as we've, uh, as we've designed it. And then the funding for the program uh, can come from government grants or private sector grants, such as the uh, corporate uh, social responsibility accounts. And so there's actually a great opportunity here. Uh, all of you are familiar with the corporate social responsibility uh, accounts. Uh, th this is, there is a fantastic opportunity in terms of uh, using these to eliminate unemployment. So uh, this is a community-driven job guarantee. And so uh, this is not a top-down approach where a central bureaucracy legislates these are the services that are going to be performed by the, uh, by the community service core. No. The uh, needs of the community are identified by local community uh, groups. And so they are best positioned to know what the priority should be. And uh, they will uh, also identify the existing skill set of the local unemployed population. And then, of course, as I'm sure you can anticipate, we're going to be matching the skills with the needs. And uh, we want to employ the exist existing skill set creatively in order to serve the specific needs of the community. And if the local skills are not adequate to address the needs that have been identified, then we can target those skills as ones we want to focus on through various on-the-job training uh, and, and, uh, and the identification of the needed skills. There is a strong counter-cyclical adjustment to this program uh, because when the economy uh, goes into a downturn and the uh, and, and the private sector shrinks, then normally unemployment would rise, but in this case, the job guarantee program will expand in response to the falling demand for labor. And then when the uh, economy recovers and spending in the economy increases, then there is an expansion of the private sector and people are hired out of the community service core or job guarantee uh, core. So instead of alternating between occasional employment and unemployment, or cyclical employment and unemployment, um, the 
the program provides this counter cyclical uh, adjustment so that there is a move from a private sector jobs to the community service jobs and vice versa. So how will the private sector be affected? Well, first, as I stress, these are not activities that are going to be competing with the private sector. Uh, they will complement the, the uh, private sector. And then when the economy expands and the demand for labor increases, the private sector can hire out of the community service uh, pool at a markup over the job guarantee wage. And one of the other benefits of this program is that firms face a considerable amount of uncertainty regarding fluctuations in demand in the economy. And due to this, they are hesitant to invest in um, new technologies, in um, retooling. But when firms feel confident that the job guarantee program is maintaining a sufficient level of demand in the economy, then they will not be as uncertain regarding future demand, and so they will be more ready uh, to invest in new technologies and so on. Now, the traditional idea of public works needs to be rethought. You know, I was reading um, some of the uh, commentary on the Jeddah Chamber of Commerce uh, website and also talking with my students. We have uh, many uh, Saudi uh, college students in the United States and at my university, University of Missouri, Kansas City as well. And the message I keep getting is the problem with young people is everyone wants to start out as a manager. No one wants to start out at an entry level position and then, you know, uh, through hard work, uh, work their way up and so on. Well, uh, we really need to rethink the idea of community service employment in uh, this regard because there's a lot of very creative things that we can do that come broadly under the headings of the um, uh, digital media, new technologies, the stuff that young people are interested in and they are good at. And these tools, new technologies and, um, and uh, the digital, uh, the, the uh, digital media can be used in the service of community engagement, social entrepreneurship, and, um, and, uh, and public services. And uh, Fadel's gonna talk uh, more about all of uh, these kinds of issues. Building community capital to complement the other forms of capital, enriching the social fabric. Um, and so uh, assistance to the elderly and the disabled, oral history projects, preserving valuable community values, traditions, and achievements. There's actually a number of examples in the history of uh, various types of um, community service uh, programs. And then 
the leveraging of the digital media resources uh, and, um, and uh, green type projects that enhance the environment. And then, you know, when young people learn skills in the community service jobs, they can then take them back into the private sector and employ them there for the benefit of society at large. And uh, I uh, keep reminding my, my uh, Saudi students that, um, you know, uh, your country has such a fantastic opportunity to be a global leader in uh, solar energy. And uh, it, uh, I think, it is, is a great opportunity to promote these skills development through the community service uh, program. And of course, not everyone who enters the uh, job guarantee program is coming in with no skills at all. And so those who do have more skills in education uh, can, it, it can use those for the benefit of the community and the public at large. So tutoring, artists doing uh, various kinds of projects, uh, websites, and conservation of local and regional history, culture, and traditions. Um, and you can see the uh, kinds of ideas that we've come up with. A lot of these we came up with by asking young people, what would you be interested in getting involved in? And then, uh, having a dialogue about that. Okay, so many, many examples, many of them in the area of the green technologies. And in the early 2000s, uh, Argentina was going through a social and economic uh, crisis and I received an invitation from, um, uh, actually, uh, it, it, it was an invitation from the ILO, uh, International Labor Organization, to, um, to go down to Argentina and work with their Ministry of Labor. Uh, and we ended up making three proposals all of which were passed into law. And the one that I want to concentrate on is the community service employment program that we proposed. It's called the HEFES program. Now, I should emphasize that what actually uh, got passed was not exactly the proposal that we made. Um, but nevertheless, we can learn from both the benefits and the weaknesses of the HEFES uh, program, the Head of Household Community Service uh, Program in Argentina. So first of all, this program created two million jobs in a very short amount of time. Uh, and of course, when the uh, employment increases, then uh, income increases and spending increases. So, of course, uh, GDP went up. It also resulted in increased uh, labor force participation. And it, as I've been stressing, increased community and civic engagement in the economy. Uh, the other thing that happened, which was really interesting, is that initially there was very high unemployment and the program 
was quite large. But then, as a result of the income and demand and spending that was generated by two million unemployed now working in the economy, all that spending resulted in more private sector sales and investment. And so the program that initially had been large then shrank as the private sector expanded. So uh, it, it uh, resulted in many uh, unemployed who had been out of work for a substantial amount of time re-entering the private sector. And in some cases, it, there was nothing re about it. They were entering the private sector, perhaps for the first time. So here's just a graph that shows uh, the initial increase in the program in, and this, if you see in the b bottom here, I mean, this is uh, January uh, 02, July 02, January 03, July 03, right? You can see the, the uh, development. So initially the program expanded substantially, but then it, sh it, it shrank back as the economy recovered. And then here's the re-entry into the private sector. So um, between September 02 and September 03, 57,120 uh, new, newly employed uh, entering the private sector, okay? So that, that's, uh, I would say, you know, very successful. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Fadl, who's going to talk about some of his exciting ideas for uh, a, a, a program like this for your country. Thank you. Um, so I want to emphasize again that the, the examples that we've listed here are really just examples. That the, the core of a successful community service employment program, that it has to be done at the local level, invented and innovated by the local youth, by the community needs, and driven by the community. The financing, we, we've talked about it in the case of Saudi Arabia with the CSR accounts, it's not going to be a problem. Government grants, venture grants, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. But it really has to be driven by, by youth uh, in, in this particular case. So this is where social entrepreneurship becomes a very important model for sparking this new employment sector. So think about the traditional government sector. Think about the traditional private sector. And now we're adding a third sector, the social innovation sector. When you're talking about social innovation and entrepreneurship in general, even for-profit entrepreneurship, you have to start with a very simple driving force. It's passion. You can't have people work hard on something that they don't believe in, they don't enjoy, they don't admire. You have to be willing to work day and night, dream and sleep and wake up believing in a particular goal. Uh, it can be something related to the environment, it can be something related to the elderly, something related to uh, human rights or women's rights or whatever it is. It has to be something that's driven by local interest at the local level. Once you have that passion, then what I propose is the four basic steps of developing a successful social entrepreneurship uh, model. First is problem identification. Identify the problem that you're interested in um, and then do your homework. Uh, root cause analysis. Problems, social problems have multiple roots, multiple causes. You want to make sure you assess them, study them, and really know what you're dealing with. Once you know what you're dealing with, you do uh, an exercise called asset mapping. You're going to survey everything that, that's already out there, 
all the organizations, the national resources, the human capital resources, government programs, private sector programs, international experiences, all the resources that you can use to address that particular problem. And in that asset mapping exercise, what you'll identify is essentially what's missing or what's not working. So you'll identify a gap, something that needs to be changed, something that needs to be motivated, uh, modified, something that needs to be introduced maybe. Sometimes a new thing needs to be added. Um, and that's where social innovation comes in. That's where the idea of bringing together the resources in a different way, sometimes it's a coordination problem. All the resources are there. They're just not coordinated the right way. The ministries are not talking to each other. Youth programs are not coordinating. Uh, employment and training and education programs are not being put together the right way. And that's where the intervention comes in. And as, as you're looking at this, you're probably wondering, well, why is this called social entrepreneurship? Drop the social. And you have entrepreneurship. This is the same model. I'm not inventing anything here. Right? This is what entrepreneurship is about. Here, essentially, we're saying take the model to the social community development sector and make it the driving force for community development for youth employment programs. All the skills that you need for making this model successful, these are transferable skills, as, as Matt talked about. These are skills that you develop in this sector and transfer to the private sector. Um, anytime you're, you're looking at the, an HR application process, usually one of the interview questions is they look at your resume and they pick something random, sometimes not related to education. Say, so, oh, you worked on a, you, you played on a basketball team. What did you learn? And if you start telling them these are my stats, there's so many rebounds and so many goals or whatever, they say, well, you didn't learn anything. You're just citing your stats, right? The learning is intentional reflection on the skills you developed on a particular random setting, uh, being on a basketball team. Time management, teamwork, uh, work ethic. These are the things that are transferable from a basketball team to a social network to a corporate uh, setting. So this is really what we're talking about. These are transferable skills that we want to create um, at the local community level through social entrepreneurship programs. Then finally, I want to close with um, a, a financing model that goes beyond just providing money. And once again, I'm not inventing anything here. This is Silicon Valley. This is venture capitalism. What venture capitalists essentially identified about 15 years ago was the following. They said, yes, we were venture capitalists. We make a lot of money. We're successful. We know how to do it. And usually at the end of the year, we, we give away money to charity because we make a lot of money. We give them money and say, do good. Good luck. See you next year. They realized that was a big mistake. That was a waste of money in some cases. Then they said, why not use the venture capital model for philanthropy to nonprofit organizations? What is the venture capital model? We give you money and brain power. We give you money and consulting and marketing advice to actually make your startup work, to make it successful. They said, we're going to do the same with nonprofits. We're going to call it social venture, right? So we're going to give you money and brain power to jumpstart a nonprofit or to take an existing nonprofit and revamp it and refocus its efforts to make a maximum social impact as opposed to a maximum profit in the venture capital world. It's the exact same model. Uh, started about 10, 15 years ago, um, and now in, in the U.S. it's, it's all, over, um, all over the country. Every state has at least one or two cities with, uh, with a social venture partner firm. Uh, millions of dollars focusing on the nonprofit sector. They send out call for applications. The local nonprofits send them their business plans, their proposals for the venture. They go through a selection process, interview process. They step on the stage and they pitch their idea. They come up with an assessment plan. How are you going to measure results? And then we're going to give you the money. And we're going to work with you on the board with consulting advice, marketing advice, networking advice to actually make it happen. So here, in Saudi Arabia in particular, we have a fantastic opportunity with the existing resources, financial resources, 
in the private sector and lots of knowledge base consulting brain power in the private sector to tap into the young people's energy and ideas and innovations to say, look, we're going to work with you. Come up with an interesting idea, something you're passionate about, something that you want to change in your community in a positive way. We'll give you the money. We'll work with you on developing a business plan, a marketing plan, an assessment plan, measuring goals, measuring and, and reassessing year after year, and pitching your idea to other investors, maybe taking it into the private sector into the future. These are the professional business skills, the transferable skills that we're talking about. So with this, I want to um, invite everybody to join us in, in just a couple minutes to um, Q&A. Um, I'll be interested in hearing what you have to say. But with, in closing, um, uh, this is what I just said earlier, money plus brain power. Sorry, I forgot to click yeah, to maximize social impact. So in closing, um, I want to highlight that the current unemployment situation calls for urgent and bold action. And here I'm, I'm leaving it open-ended by the government, by the private sector, by youth organizations, by everybody. Uh, the traditional employment policies that we've tried all over the world have been not, not very effective uh, in ending unemployment, especially large-scale youth unemployment. And, and here we have an opportunity to develop uh, a model for the entire region, for the GCC countries and, and other countries around the world to say this can be done. So we can start small with a pilot project uh, and move to a large-scale, you know, fully functioning social entrepreneurship, venture um, philanthropy uh, model. Full employment is possible, desirable, obviously, um, and affordable, financially affordable. And with that, um, thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we would like to open the floor now for any questions, any comments. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the sponsor, the, the Benzegger Group, and you're welcomed. And it's very interesting what you say, um, coming from well-known universities, um, as well as you are in a um, culture or a society where the laws are continuously uh, changing to deal with uh, uh, needs of the community. You use certain uh, key words, community services, uh, you used uh, innovation, you used uh, the word of uh, um, social corporate responsibility, um, and you used the most important, the energy of the youth is not like the energy of the elders. They are supposed to be wise and to guide while the youth but <clears throat> forgive me, um, it's not a contradiction, but it comes in parallel. You spoke about two specific aspects of the community or the society. One being um, uh, the, the, the private sector, and one being the civil sector or the community services. Community services are, are in relation or married to government, like uh, uh, the, um, the, um, the municipality, where, where uh, for example, simple thing like uh, cleaning the seashore, or uh, for example, creating from within the slums or the ghettos of certain areas, uh, sort of like uh, sports centers, so that there can be uh, a health program. My point is that you identified that Saudi Arabia has a majority of youth that are unemployed, unmotivated, have all the amenities, be it universities, be it even a certain amount of, uh, for example, uh, uh, unemployment fees of 2,000 riyals. Why should I get employed if I am uh, already getting, unless I get four or 5,000? So 
the issue for us in Saudi Arabia, from my perspective, is how do we get our partners, which is the government, which is the one that restricts our movement if we are to take any public initiative. It is easy for a corporation to provide funding, like NCB often, uh, social corporate responsibility, what have you. But it, uh, that has not elevated or relieved the, the main problem of getting these, ch uh, these youngsters to be responsible, to actually get into the job place and take over something, whether it is in the private sector or whether it is, as you called it, um, social, social uh, civil uh, projects. We, we, are not, we are not responding. Your, your, your criteria, your, your uh, explanation of all this is fine, but when you bring it from America to Saudi Arabia, where, where the actual um, volunteers in American communities are participating, whether for pay or guaranteed employment, are, are actually participating, encouraging the ghettos, encouraging the, 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 the um, um, underprivileged kids, the poor families to go out there. And while here, we are not able to actually get the attention. So it's not about being critical of government or of the private sector. It's about what, what can we do to bring the attention of those individuals who are authoritative and who can make the difference in our community. I hope I've made myself clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first, I want to start by saying that, uh, again, we, we, we didn't mean to, um, to say that this is, this is going to be replicated from the US to, to Saudi Arabia or any other country. There's, there's definitely recognition that sometimes the, the rules and regulations of, in the country uh, are not necessarily conducive to successful social entrepreneurship. And, and that's something that, that has to be addressed, obviously. If we're, if we're going to use the, the youth employment, uh, the youth of the country as a source of energy, as a source of economic growth, we have to facilitate the right um, economic environment, legal environment, um, to, to facilitate job creation programs uh, of the nature that I, that I described. Um, uh, Zaid, do you wanna? If I can add a point from the previous session. Uh, Professor Xavier from uh, Columbia University asked some very simple questions. He said, if Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook was a Saudi, would Facebook have been born? <laughs> no, exactly. So, so if, if the answer is no, then, then we know where to look, where to start, where to, start to work. The, uh, our educational system, is it a child as, as, uh, Dr. Xavier, as uh, Dr. Xavier was saying, is born with a lot of uh, curiosity. A child will ask many, many questions. But by the time they, they grow up in the educational system here in Saudi, they don't want to ask any more questions. They, so, so we are destroying uh, their ability to innovate, their dreams, their cur uh, curiosity. Uh, we have an educational, educational system that takes a young person who's curious, imaginative, wants to produce, and it destroys him. This is, this is, this is one of the uh, problems, one of the challenges. Thank you very much. I, uh, let me just uh, put the point up because uh, maybe I can answer it uh, according to your behavior. But I wish there was a little bit more of uh, government employees or social institutions. I really uh, admire you as a as a private company coming here and sponsoring all this. But you, there is nothing in our hands to do. What, 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 is about, what is the use of the education if we cannot be innovative in a sense of coming up with a solution for our society? Our society needs to ha not to have the private sector educated. Like you said, if you take out of the private sector, uh, and, uh, and make a statistics, you will find very bright people, you will find very capable people, but they have not only been demoralized, but they have been marginalized because they do not fit the, 
the status quo. If I may put it in a different way, be it Binzagar or other companies in, uh, who are substantially uh, of heritage and so forth, they are the status quo. They sell their hardware and their products and they keep the status quo. And they cannot change because if they go out of the norm, they will be actually, uh, shall we say, uh, put on, uh, on, on, on the blacklist. So the issue is, is what can we do as a private sector to, to, to do social programs that will provide jobs to, for example, the uneducated, or if your company takes on some Saudis, nine out of 10 of these Saudis are going to be asked to leave if they don't leave within a month. Not because they couldn't become managers, because they don't have the motivation to, or, or the understanding. If you take uh, our society, within 50 years, we were expected to learn languages, become modernized, and to also hold PhDs so we can run state-of-the-art factories from petrochemical to even tire manufacturing. But we don't have the culture or, or behavior. We were traders who used to open our shop to sell uh, herbs from, from the Silk Route. 50 years ago, we had pilgrimage. Today, we sell one-fifth of the oil to the world. But our psychology, our understanding is, is, is not there. And if you want to tell me I'm married to the government, of course I am. And I am, I, am, I think, a, a good citizen. But being a good citizen doesn't necessarily mean that I will be the, the right citizen or the citizen that contributes because the government provides for us most things we are not asked to participate. Yesterday there was, there was in the hall, Thank you. <laughs> um, Sheikh, um, yes, what you're saying, Mamun, is reality, but it's not that bleak. Um, I, think, I think really the hope is in the youth. Okay, we definitely cannot ignore the, uh, uh, the youth uh, force, really. And it could be definitely looked upon as a double bend uh, element in society. But um, I am, I would consider myself a social entrepreneur. I have been in this field of really training, trying to uh, change mindsets, which is really what is needed today. And uh, it's very challenging, but it is happening. It is taking time. Definitely the core of the problem is the education uh, system. And we see that Really, today, um, we have a new um, uh, person in position who's really focusing on the core, really, which is the elementary schooling. Uh, I think that, beside also what we just heard from, you know, the, the royal degrees about really um, um, banning, you know, these uh, fanatic and religious groups, and right away, the, both ministries uh, of education and of interior really, um, you know, um, uh, joining forces and trying to spot these uh, mentalities uh, to, to clean up out the, this, the ministry out of them. This is a very, very, very hopeful and strong sign. Thank you very much. I just wanted to really paint, the, show the, the glass half full, okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for such wonderful presentation concerning one of the main topics of today, which is the meat, the meat of the matter, which the people call in the United States. Actually, based on what I've said, uh, first of all, let me talk about education, education and education, education as well. And I think until we go back 500 years ago, when the Renaissance age started in Europe, you start with education. And the first thing, the, the first thing for start with education, translation, consideration, renovation, and then addition, and then invention. And that started with education. Yesterday, we met uh, one of the most important uh, educators in the United States called James Kelly. And I think that really James Kelly is very familiar. And uh, James Kelly is a director of Menlo University. 
And this is the place where His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Walid uh, bin Salad, and Khalid al Jafali, and most of the very big uh, business figures of this country graduated. And he said something very important. He said that really one reason why His Royal Highness has made all of this great fortune is that because he was receiving education at our school. And of course, it was not marketing for the School of Manila University, but just to give uh, some sort of emphasis on the need. And we talk about education, we talk about educators. And we talk about educators, we talk about professionalism. So the teacher, for example, must be professional. And when you say professional, means that really I would take the Finnish uh, education example in my mind. So education. Uh, yes, the question is, the question is, how can you make all of these kind of things and provide jobs for the unemployed people in any country, and even start with the United States when we understand, when you know that according to the last report about the unemployment in the United States has just stated that there are 10,000 professors that are working as waiters in coffee shops. The question is, how can we design our own, uh, our own uh, policy here regarding uh, providing uh, the, uh, I mean, jobs, and before providing job force, how can we achieve uh, knowledge-based economy so as to have uh, the jobs available for everybody? How can we knowledge-based economy, uh, this investing in the human resources, how can we do that? That's the solution. When you give me experience, I say, yeah, it's pre pretty wonderful, Canada, United States here. How can we design? How can we become designers of uh, uh, problem solutions? That's the whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to I want to pick on the on the education piece because it's 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 extremely important. Um, and and I'll, I'll touch on some of the comments that were made as well. Uh, here we're not really thinking of this employment program as a silver bullet that will solve all the problems of the world or the problems of a particular economy. Um, if when we get a chance to share the, the literature with you, especially this this particular program. We introduce it as one component of a platform of policies um, that have to be implemented at the same time. When, when you're facing a crisis, um, a youth unemployment crisis, for example, like we're, we're dealing with now in the Middle East, the, the way I describe it is like you're trying to fix the car as you're driving it. You have to act with urgency, but at the same time you have to think long term, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead. One of the big mistakes that uh, my home country, Tunisia, made um, and that we're facing today uh, in the last decade is massive investment in higher education and exclusively valuing higher education, university degrees over technical education, vocational education. And this is not just in terms of funding the schools or, or the programs but really creating a stigma, a social stigma that was enforced by the education system that if you don't make it through the high school exam, the national exam, you're a failure. And if you're a failure, you're not gonna make it into middle class status, you're not gonna get married, open a house, afford you know, middle class status. Today, in Tunisia, for example, we have tons of PhDs, double master's degrees, and you can't find a plumber who can actually fix whatever you need to fix. You can't find an electrician. You, you call them on their cell phone, it's almost as if they're gonna tell you, well, talk to my assistant first, and, and then maybe I'll, I'll show up and, and work. They're not skilled, they act like the prime minister or, or, or a medical surgeon, and that's a problem. You're trying to attract foreign investors that say, sure, we'll, we'll hire some accountants and lawyers and and, and managers in the office, but also we need 20 machinists, uh, 30 electrician, and, and people who have technical skills. And, and that's a problem that's gonna take a generation to fix. And it's not easy because you're trying to, to change a stigma, not just educational system. So you need to think long-term by really valuing technical skills and creating parallel tracks. The German system is, is a very good system uh, to, to look at parallel tracks where in the middle school and the high school level, you're actually learning math and science, but also workshop type of things, you know, craft, arts and crafts. And this is, this is really the way to go for, for the long term. Uh, just one, one example, one idea maybe that, thinking out loud here, and we, we discussed it the last a couple of days. Saudi Arabia faces a housing uh, crisis. Um, 
and housing crisis that matches youth employment and, and all everything that goes with it. If you can imagine um, a scenario where the um, educational system can create uh, a vocational training component within the education system, parallel track, maybe even optional, right? that says if you go into this parallel track, it doesn't mean that you'll never get a college degree or whatever, it's a parallel track, afternoon programs, weekend programs, whatever. And if you go into it as you finish high school and then you enter a more intensive internship vocational training program with some of the major construction companies in the city, you get paid on the job and after five years you own your apartment. And after three years in the industry, four years, whatever number you, you want to decide, you'll get um, seed money to start your own company. You're providing skills, you're valuing those skills by financing them and actually paying them decent wages, and you're solving a housing crisis, and you're giving young people a vision for the future where they can see themselves reaching a middle class status by the time they're 30, 35, they have a house, they have a decent wage, they have middle class quality of life, and they have hopes for the future. That's just one idea. You, you can think of other industries. So for me, it's always look at a problem, think creatively, and turn it into an opportunity. And with that, you need coordination between ministries of education, ministries of industry, ministries of everything else that you need. Again, fixing the car as you're driving it. Short-term solutions and long-term um, uh, planning. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Kaboob and Dr. Forsterar. Prostator. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you for the wonderful presentation, uh, especially talking maybe about uh, community services and uh, on-job training uh, in particular. I'm an ex-Aramco employee who uh, uh, Aramco used this on-job training with us all the time, which is great. My fear with uh, employment or unemployment is we are coming up to uh, a new generation. It's the robotic generation that is going to replace most of, uh, of the employees. What are we going to do when that happens? When you have a robot works for uh, a thousand employee, maybe one or two robots, takes a place of a, a thousand employee. What are we going to do? Have you done any surveys? Is there any studies? Because what you have talked about today, it's been probably said and done many, many times. Yes, we do need some awareness in the kingdom and we're working on it and there's a lot of uh, things happening nowadays and I have a great faith in our youth and in our government and the society and we're growing slowly but surely. But I think our worst fear, and something I never heard any conference even talked about, which is the new robotic generation that is going to steal most of our jobs, whether in health, education, factories, you name it, it will take over. Are we ready for that next generation? Have we done anything about it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, on robotics and um, technolo technological change in general that you know displaces workers, uh, it's it's not new. Deindustrialization in, in many industrialized countries. The, the place where I live in Ohio is part of what is called the Rust Belt, where all the industrial towns are now um, essentially empty and no jobs. Lots of people still live there. Lots of unemployment. Lots of crime. Lots of social problems. Um, 
how do you address those things? And this is really where the more economic problems you have in a community, the more opportunities for uh, social entrepreneurship, the more opportunities for social innovation, the more opportunities for these types of social ventures uh, that I'm talking about. And I, and I speak f from experience because this uh, venture philanthropy model, this is something that, that I do on campus as part of service learning courses, get the students in the community to participate in these innovative programs. And there's plenty of work to be done. There is never a case where um, a student was asked to go find an opportunity and I don't assign them to a project. I tell them, go find something that you're passionate about in the community and tell me what you want to do about it and get it done. And there was never a case where a student found a local nonprofit that they're passionate about and they turned them away and said, sorry, we don't have any work for you. We're, we're, we're good. There's, there's always shortage of brain power. There's shortage of contribution, human contribution. So there's, there's potential. Uh, technology is great. It, it makes things better, faster, and cheaper. But it doesn't end there. Society is not just about technology. Society is about social relations. It's about social fabric. It's about the history of the community, the tradition of the community. Those things robots can't, can't do. It's only humans that do that. And they, they take jobs, but it's, it's our job to innovate and to recreate an environment within which people can have a decent quality of life by maximizing social impact. You talked a lot about what schools can do and what companies can do, what the government can do, but don't you think that one basic sort of prerequisite for all this to work is that um, it starts at home? It starts with your upbringing, the culture you have at home. So you can do a lot of things from the company in the school. There's no doubt that a lot of things can be done in the schools, but you need the receivers of this, the user of that service, to be prepped for it, to be prepared. There needs to be a driver where people want to go out and work. I mean, your example in Argentine is very good, but this is what you're presenting is a way to create a job where there are none, and the receiver is willing to take that job. So you have people in Argentine that would do anything to earn a buck, and you create uh, a valuable uh, workplace so that becomes attractive to people. But is that the case here? I'm not, I know you're not saying that it can work here. I'm just saying that I think we forget one of the basic points, which is how do we prep the youth to become motivated to take a job at all in the end and to go through an educational system where there are demands. You will be challenged your entire life. How do you prepare your youth for that? It's too late when you go to the workforce or have to be part of the workforce when you're 18 or 20 years old to figure out, oh, suddenly somebody is actually demanding something of me. I have to produce something to get something. I didn't know the world worked like that. I just would like to add to his. We, we have the wealth. It's not that the, the money is, uh, you can go around and pick it in the street sometime. That's not the... point to raise here that's, that's very specific about, about Saudi Arabia is we have nearly two million people in, uh, on the, uh, in the unemployment program. Uh, we have nearly 10 million expats in the country. So we have 10 million jobs. We have two million unemployed. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not like the jobs aren't there. The jobs are there. So uh, 
if I'm hearing the folks you're right, is, 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 is uh, job creation is, yes, we do need job creation, but the jobs are there. Okay. Um, uh, can I go back to the, to the gentleman's uh, comment for, for a second? So the, the, the question that came out of it is the starting at, at home. Right, it's not just the school, it's not just the, the outside environment, but the, um, the way you're, you start these things. Well, are we gonna give up on the existing generation just because whatever happened in the home, whatever happened in the last 20 years or 25 years of their life? I say no, I say we just work with whatever we have. So one of the things that I found extremely useful in the entrepreneurship education program that I, that I developed is before we even start to think about what, what the venture is, what they're interested in, I tell them, don't even think about what's coming next. What we're gonna do for the first several hours of the day is I want you to take a, this large piece of paper and, and draw a life map, your own personal life. What are the things that matter to you? When was the first time you cried? The first time you lost a family member? The first time you were really excited about something, the first time you, things that really marked your personal life and, and, and draw it in any, in any creative particular way you're interested in. Some people draw pictures, some people draw cycles or circles and graphs and all kinds of things. And then I ask them to actually talk about it to, to everybody else. Tell me what you feel, tell me who you are. You have to know who you are before you can identify your passion. And this is something that you can do when you're 10, when you're 20, when you're 30. Actually, most people tell you sh this is an exercise you should do every couple of years. Ask yourself who you are, what you're passionate about, what's, what's your goal in life? And yes, it can be tough if you've been demotivated for 20, 25 years. I'm not saying this is gonna work for everybody, but there are ways to start with where you are and reignite some sort of passion because I, I believe in, in human beings being motivated by something that sometimes just turned off for whatever reason. So we just have to work on the existing generation and learn from it and work on the next generation so that we're not repeating the same mistakes. So, sorry. Is this, is this one still on? Okay. Uh, so there are some other sessions, and uh, so I'd like to propose that we uh, make some concluding remarks. Uh, then we can take a break. Those who uh, want to attend some other sessions can do so. Those who would like to uh, have some more food, can do so, and then those who would like to continue discussion informally, um, we would be happy to, to, to stick around um, and brainstorm together with you to address some of the issues that you're bringing up. Um, in the last, last two, three minutes, I, uh, want to mention a program we have uh, in our department that demonstrates and actually FADL also uh, does a similar type of program. Um, and uh, what we do is in addition to whatever tests and homework that students have to uh, complete to get a grade for their class, uh, we also tax them. And do you have the, uh, the buckaroo or the DVD? So here's, we have a departmental currency in our department. It's, uh, it's the, uh, called the buckaroo because, you know, buck is slang for, for a dollar and then our mascot is the kangaroo, so buckaroo and then you know, Kansas with cowboys and so on, a buckaroo. And here's, uh, Foddles are called uh, DVDs, Denison Volunteer Dollars. So 
uh, and then we've got pictures of famous economists, some of whom, in, in any case. Um, so we tax them uh, five buckaroos, say, you know, per week. And uh, the tax and the requirement that the tax be paid only in this currency, which has zero intrinsic value, the tax and the requirement that the tax be paid in this currency creates a demand for these otherwise worthless pieces of paper and gives it a value. For example, we have seen students uh, buying and selling these. You know, some students do more than their minimum amount of work. Some students don't have time because they're working full time to do. Oh, I didn't say. I didn't say what you had to do to to obtain them. One hour of community service, and you, and that's how you get a hold. Of, uh, sorry, I. I uh, uh, had a, lo a long several flights and I'm um, uh, suffering from. So uh, Fadl, take over and make just a two, three points about the program. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll give Sorry. you a break. So uh, the, the community service program that Matt is talking about, the Bakuru program or the DVD program, students sign up for a class. They know from day one that they have to pay a tax at the end of the semester. If they don't pay the tax, they lose 5% of their grade. So it's a severe grade penalty. And they say, well, how do we get these things that you print in your office? Well, you say you have to work for them. One hour of community service, you get X number of these bills. And then all of a sudden, the students start looking for community service jobs in the local nonprofit sector. We facilitate this for them. We don't tell them where to go, but sometimes they, they already know where to go. For each hour, they earn one of these. At the end of the semester, they pay their tax. They get their 5% grade, otherwise they lose it. Some of them work more, than ou more hours than what is needed to pay the tax. So they end up saving a surplus of these things. Some of them actually trade them with other students, because at the end of the semester, if you haven't done the community service and you're gonna lose 5% of your grade, well, guess what? You're willing to do anything to get a hold of these things. So some students actually trade them for money, for US dollars. And that creates an exchange rate between this worthless piece of paper that we print in the office and the actual currency. You can imagine the exchange rate in the beginning of the semester being really weak and the day of the deadline being really you know, appreciated. Um, some students trade it for services. So I, our, our college is far away from public transportation. So students usually sometimes pay for a ride to the airport with these things. Uh, my favorite example, uh, one of my students didn't have the money to pay the tax, the, the currency to pay the tax, and the deadline was coming up the next day. But he had excellent note-taking skills in class. He had perfect notes to study for the exam. There was this other student who had extra notes, extra currency, and he didn't have good notes to study for the final. He sold them copies of his lecture notes for these things and they both paid their taxes and they both study, studied for the final and it was a win-win situation. So what we're saying here, the economics department acts as the sovereign currency issuer, as the government that prints its own currency, collects taxes in that same currency, and then the private sector does whatever it wants as long as they pay the tax. They can trade, they can innovate, they can create a bank, they can create whatever they want. Uh, at Denison, actually, we developed the bond market, so students can invest in government bonds, and in six months, they get 5% return. You can't beat that anywhere these days, except at Denison. Um, they can open a savings account or a retirement account so that when they retire from the campus, when they graduate, we send them retirement checks in this currency. They can use the same currency to hire currently enrolled students who actually have to pay the tax and they can hire them to work with them or work for them in their favorite nonprofit organization. So it builds an ongoing culture of volunteerism beyond the, the four years of the college. So these are things that, I'm not saying these are things that can work here or have to work here, 
But there's always ways to innovate, to inspire our young people, not necessarily at the college level, but even earlier, from first grade, from second grade, that there is time for learning. And this is a service learning project. This is how they learn about sovereign monetary systems. This is how they learn about government deficits, unemployment, inflation. All of these concepts are built into this small economy that we're building in the classroom. It's an economy driven by service, not uh, uh, kind of a, a for-profit uh, economy. To maximize GDP in our experimental economy, we have to maximize the number of volunteer hours that the students are putting in. That's economic growth. That's wealth for the community. That's GDP, right? Uh, unemployment in this system, we have zero unemployment. Every student who's ready, willing, and able to work can always find employment in the volunteer sector and the nonprofit sector. We've never had any unemployment so far. And guess what? There's no inflation, too. So it's fantastic. Right. So with this, I'll, we'll be more than happy to take questions, gather maybe around a table or two to um, have a cup of tea and, and talk some more. Um, but we do also understand that some of you have to uh, be somewhere else uh, at this time. So thank you again for the invitation and for being here. Thank you.